Hi everybody, my name is Tim McGarry. I'm going to be your guest tonight on Music Studio Live. Coming up on this episode of Music Studio Live. Give me a chance and I'll show you the way you should be. Cause the only thing in my way is me. And she's like, honey, I'm going to go to Atlanta. And she never looks, she goes, don't come back. Oh. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> So Secret Service came to my house. I was like, yeah, I thought I was like, oh. off the road from missing person. So I'm like, I'm all leather. Wow. Still, my makeup's blowing down. And I didn't write with like some big writers. And I'm glad I didn't because I wasn't ready. Give me a chance and I'll show you the way you should be. Rolling. <laughs> Here we go. Hi, guys. My name is Daryl. I'm a drummer and producer. And I started a podcast with my friend Sarah called Music Studio Live. Together, we talk with singer-songwriters and music makers about all things related to music. We hope you enjoy the show, and here we go. Hey, guys, this is Music Studio Live, and I'm Sarah Hadica. And I'm Daryl Nutt. <laughs> I don't know why I said it like that. It and, was nice. Made me feel and happy. this is our music singer-songwriter podcast. Yay. And uh, what are we talking about today? Our guest today is Tim McGeary. Here's a magazine cover that he's he was a on. handsome fella he's a good dude he's been through a lot and he writes about it and these songs are really good mm -hmm. how can i emphasize that his songs are really, really awesome good. awesome that's really our word. awesome awesome is yeah, our word it is all right he's good he's awesome one two three awesome. really awesome oh. <laughs> <laughs> we're totally not in sync uh, one two three awesome awesome oh, uh, anyway. i was i wasn't sure okay Anyway, Tim talks about all kinds of cool stuff. We play a couple songs with him. He's a great dude. He's a, a prominent member of the Island Hopper Songwriter Festival mm -hmm. that happens here in Southwest Florida every year. And it brings a lot of singer-songwriters and young artists and guys that have written hits in the 90s. Yeah, huge All hits. genres of music. Is that how you say it? Genres of music? Mm -hmm. it sounds so official. Um, is there anything you'd like to talk about? Well, on this little intro, I mean, basically, just speaking of Tim, he is just a very compelling, compelling guy. Um, I, I cried a couple. Times. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say, I mean, actually, the interview with him, it was very emotional. And I think that you'll really enjoy it. So I laugh, too, though. Oh, yeah, he's funny. He's got quite the stories. <laughs> so he does. I just thought about one of them. But you'll hear it in the uh, podcast. <laughs> yes, you will. I have a question for you, Sarah. We're both performers. We're both musicians. We both play in our local area and do concerts and stuff. How do you, if you're not in the mood to have an adult beverage, how do you handle when somebody wants to buy you a drink? Because part of our job is to sell alcohol sell in, in a bar room or a restaurant or something or country club. Selling drinks is kind of why they hire music most yeah. of the time. Yeah. How do you handle it? I have my way of handling, but I'm curious how okay. you handle it. Well, it kind of depends on my mood. Okay. So I guess bluntly, I will say, no, thank you. I don't drink. <laughs> well, that's pretty <laughs> Sometimes blunt. Sometimes I'll say that. That's pretty blunt. It just depends on if I'm just not really in the mood. Other times, you know what I'll do? Hmm. I'll take the drink and, and I'll just give it to someone else. Yeah, that's I've done that in the past <laughs> so, as well. So, I mean, it's probably not... You know, like the the bar probably wouldn't like that necessarily. Well, no, they're, but they're still paying for the drink. It's true. They're yeah. Still so getting the patron the sale is from the still, yeah. yes. So, and, you know, sometimes I'll just take it and I'll turn around and walk back to get my right, Or get right, if you're on stage, you get something. right back to the next song. Right. Exa just set it to the side. Yep. Give it to one of the guys. So, yeah, I mean, I'll, yeah. There's been a, a few times where if it's like a house gig situation or a place that you play a lot, mm -hmm. and if you don't feel like getting bombed on the gig because a yeah. lot of people buy you drinks um i would pretend i would have them pour water yes in a if shot you talk glass. to the bartender the bartender first. would know me yeah uh, her name was andrea i remember and she would always just send she knew to send me water and she knew which one to give to me yep and uh and and i pound it um, it's water i can pound that oh, all day yeah, absolutely <laughs> and uh and the the person that buys you the drink they feel great they helped the band they were part of the situation yep and, and, uh, and, and I could finish better. and I could finish the night. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I was just curious about that. We haven't ever really talked about that. Um, yeah. And that's something that musicians have to deal with if they don't feel like getting bombed on a gig. Right, exactly. Well, I definitely had my fair share of that. 
So, which too, is why I'm very careful. <laughs> why I'm very careful now to just not let that happen. Now, if any of our fans or patrons out there want to send up maybe pizza or chicken wings to the stage, that's awesome. I will go on break. Right I now. love them hot, spicy. And then we wings. might have to have oh. an episode on overeating. <laughs> oh, whatever. Oh, that boy. doesn't exist. Nice. Come on. All right. <laughs> so we hope you enjoy the episode segue and um this is us talking and performing some music with uh tim mcgeary tim mcgeary super awesome guy oh it looks like he's in the middle between us oh and speaking of super awesome you guys would be super awesome if you would subscribe to our podcast yes definitely uh oh it's on youtube for the mm -hmm. video versions and it's on itunes and podbean podbean and a bunch of other ones they all filter out uh, that's the audio version. Yep. So we hope you like it and see you in a few. Peace out. <laughs> Enjoy episode two. <laughs> You're tuned into Music Studio Live. Hi, Tim. Hi, Tim. Hi, guys. Thanks for doing this, man. This is awesome. This sounded great today. It was so much fun. The music segment was awesome. I can't wait for you guys to hear it. Goosebumps. <laughs> so Tim McGeary is an awesome songwriter. He's been working on the craft for a long, long time. Long time. Long time. Mm -hmm. Starting in the 70s mm -hmm. in the punk rock genre, <laughs> which is awesome. Yeah, that's pretty funny. Tell us about the 70s. Yeah, why is that funny? In CBGBs in San Francisco. Yeah, um, the... Uh, well, San Francisco, we was out there. I was going to the School of Recording Arts, and it was really cool. And that's when they were still using tape. And um, the uh, the one guy, the teacher, has that. He goes, when I first started recording, they used to send me out to the Beehive and get the wax. I'm like, wow. wow. It's way back in the day. <laughs> yeah. And it, but it, and he was really good, and he did a lot of orchestra stuff around the world, like, you know, um, like in Europe and stuff. Cool. So uh, we were playing, and there was a girl named, there was two guys, uh, Keith and, uh, and and Lane and uh, they had a, this girl uh, Mary Monday, and it was funny because like you know she in this like leather garb and she had this like group of transvestites that would follow her everywhere. So there was like I have that too. <laughs> you That's do. crazy. No, but I'm saying, but it's funny because, but these weren't like good looking transvestites. <laughs> these were like, were you a halfback one time, and you have blue cut, you know? <laughs> Manly. Wow. So you know. You should try to get that razor stubble off before you go out. Nah. So, so uh, but it was funny. So we, that was, our, that was my first recording record. It was called Mary Monday and the Bitches. I was one of the bitches. And uh, we uh, did a song called uh, Gave My Punk Jacket to Ricky and Joey's Got a Pop Gun. Joey's Got a Pop Gun. <laughs> I heard that song, actually. <laughs> I liked it. Yeah, it's really good. It was really funny. And I was reading some of the comments on That YouTube. are recent. Did you notice that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The one, one comment was... Um, uh, Mary, Mary, what's her name? Mary. Mary Monday. Mary, Mary Monday. Monday. The guy's watching. He goes, "I love this video," and that's my friend's mom. Ah, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> I was wondering what happened to her. Yeah, I, was, I wanted to get a hold of her. It would be funny to see, you know, to see what she's doing now and stuff. That's awesome. You should. Yeah, so it was great. So then, then I came back, um, and we started a band called Neighbors and Allies, and uh, we did a lot of stuff with. Um, uh, we used to open up with the Bloodless Pharaohs. Like we, there's a place in Philly called the Hot Club. And we used to, and that was like sort of like the CBGBs of Philly. And then so uh, Bloodless Pharaohs, the guitar player was Brian Setzer from the Stray Cats. Oh, wow. Oh, so cool. When we, did the, when we did the Philly Hot Club, we would be the opening, I mean, the, uh, the headline band. When we played New cool. York with them, we would be the opener band. Oh, yeah, so, oh cool. interesting. Yeah, in fact, when uh, he went over to uh, the, day, the day he decided to go to do the Stray Cats, you know, he said he, we had a long talk. You know, I said, hey, man, do you think I should you do this and I go yeah this guy was amazing like my favorite Brian Setzer story he broke an E string right on his high E string on his guitar and he's, and he's like I broke an E string so we used to help each other so I run to get the guitar case I get this E string I slide it up he <laughs> takes it and his lead's coming up and tune it up to right in I mean it was like wow dude, it was perfect like, timing it was, like, it was unbelievable like you never missed a beat you know and wow. I never forget it so like he was really and really nice people and Phenomenal guitar so player. So Joey Shotgun oh, is yeah. one of your, your songs, and I have it here. Oh, I'm going to play it, <laughs> and I'll put it on the screen. <laughs> yes. And this is awesome this. because this is you on bass. This is me on bass. Yeah, we, Right in the beginning. Totally serious. 
totally serious. Well, that's the whole the yeah. show. Yeah, yeah, the show. Yeah. And then when you start dancing, I get so oh, happy. It is amazing. <laughs> My friends all laugh. They go, "Nice moves, Timmy." <laughs> but the one I, the one I like, that's, that's a there sixty-four piece P bass. Oh, I, wow! Oh, I want to kill myself for selling that. There thing. you go, man. Yeah, there it goes. You're wearing a onesie too, aren't you? No, it's oh. a actually like a lab coat that was yeah. di- that was dyed uh, like a blue. And so is Brian Setzer in this? No, oh. no, no, no. No, this is a. Uh, no, this, this is Neighbors and Allies. Oh, right, right, right. This is the one. I have a great Bowie story with this band. Oh, I want to hear the Bowie story. Okay, so, stop that. So we used to... Uh, Who we, is this Bowie you talk of? That's Big Dave Bowie. Oh, David, David Bowie, yes. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm an idiot. Yeah. yeah. So what happened was um, we used to roadie for a guy named Richard Hill and the Voidoids, and uh, we asked Richard, said, listen, if we can open up for you, they used to have a thing on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night at CBGB's. If we can open up for you, we'll, we'll roadie for free, and you can take the whole door. So Richard Hell, Blondie, and Talking Heads, they all sort of came up together. They were all friends. Mm-hmm. And on Thursday night, we opened up, you know, and Richard, we came back, which is like, you guys are good. What the hell? <laughs> like, like, his band's like, we're getting nervous now. But he was, you know, he had his following. So, um, but Jimmy Destry was there from Blondie, and he was working with uh, Bowie on the Lodger record. So on Friday night, um, we finished our set, and uh, we had a friend, this guy that was a roadie uh, from Scotland from another band called Magazine, and he said, hey, boys, he goes, I'll do the roadie for you because David Bowie's out there and he wants to meet you. Wow. And, of course, we're like, wow. we're like, <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, we're what, like, oh, my phase, God. What phase of Bowie was this? Huh? This is the Lodger record. Oh, okay. 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 So, um, so sat down. Just, just an awesome, and you talk to this guy, and he's the kind of guy that, like, very introspective, like, sure. the kind of, like, he's like, He's looking in my soul, you know. I mean, <laughs> right. you know, but not not me. You know, just like because he 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 just very intense in a way, but in a soft, kind way too. But the cool thing was, so at the end of the night, he left and um, he asked the doorman. He goes, "What is the, the opening band getting paid?" And he goes, "Oh, they're not." And he goes, "Oh yeah, they are." And he took money out of his pocket and made sure that we had wow. money paid us. That's a great that's story. Awesome. That's awesome. That cool. Yeah, he was, and that's the kind of person he was. And I met people wow. that worked with him, and they said that you know. Like in the Glass Pirate or um, one of the tour managers, uh, and he said that he would go in at like 10 o'clock in the morning, and David had already been there for an hour, and at like 10 o'clock at night, and just working on the show, getting wow. everything perfect. So he just, you know, he was a hard worker. Was that hmm. a model for you? Because you were way early f- for the podcast today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. yes. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Uh, I learned that, that from David Bowie. I and I was way late. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, I mean, that's, you know, we've had some really great experiences, and then, um, and then when that band broke up, we had a couple. Um, I got in a band called the uh, the Rescue, and that was we were on yeah. A and M Records. That was more of an eighties sound. Eighties, yeah, eighty three, eighty four, because um, it was the late seventies. We were in the uh, Neighbors and Allies, mm-hmm. and then we did. We they sent us, and we go like, well, you know, because of the dollar and pound thing, we're gonna have to we're gonna go to England and do the recording. Oh damn, really, England? <laughs> You're going to fly me to England? I was like, you know, I'm from Jersey. I'm like, oh, my God, this is, like, so awesome. It's like, the, it's your dream as a kid, you know? Yeah. Really, so we, we uh, uh, yes, had just finished the owner of the Lonely Heart record. Oh. The day they left, the day we walked in. Wow. So it was cool. That was Sarm East. That was really cool. And uh, cool studio. And, and uh, I was introduced to beers, uh, bitters, which, mm-hmm. okay. Sorry, my English friends, but bitters are... <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I had a, we like, for the regular beer, but it was so great. And then we Tony Mansfield, the guy that did like Naked Eyes, you know, always oh, there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's the guy that produced it. So, so it's got it's and it has and then we had like it was weird because we'd have pockets like Hawaii, you know. We love messages. We did about two years of straight touring, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I, have, I have another funny story. I don't know how much we can get with this one, but keep talking. I, okay. I haven't even got to any <laughs> questions yet. <laughs> so the, the only thing I do notice is I can hear the air conditioner I behind can, us big, big time. time. Can can one of our friendly people, camera people, help with that? <laughs> <laughs> so um, we had this. The fr- one of the guys that we were, we had a, this guy made this like touring van. It was like a mini tour bus, and he made it out of like a like a regular like an. Uh, uh, rental van right so you had t- you had two bunks and two captains uh, five captains chairs and stuff like that cool the only problem is that this year the the way they had the, the double they had double uh, wheels in the back mm-hmm. it would shear the lug nuts off and the tires would fall off oh no it happened twice it's, uh, so, uh, so the second time so we're we had to go to atlanta we were playing the 669 club that was like sort of like the cool place back then and we had guys from a and records from england and, and la flying in to see us because they some of them hadn't seen the act yet 
So we had to get down there. And on the way in, like in uh, as like North or South Carolina, I can't which went one, but we had to get there. And the tires fell off. So uh, so oh, this guy comes oh in, God. Cherry, and he's like, he's like, he goes, well, I can't, you know, we can't get the part for two days. So he takes me into town, and we had just got off the road from missing persons. So I'm like in all leather, wow. still my makeup's flowing down, <laughs> right? And I get wow. into this this little town that's like about maybe about twenty maybe twenty buildings all tops, and there's a van outside. So I go, hey, who owns that van? This guy goes, I do. What's your name, brother? He goes, I Orville. I go, <laughs> go. I tell you what, he says, if you drive us to Atlanta, I'll give you two hundred dollars cash. I'll pay for the gas, and I'll give you a hotel, and I'll feed you. Wow. You know what I mean? So he's like, well, I gotta go ask my wife. So we go to his house, and he's got this, like, 400-pound wife sitting in front of the TV. <laughs> she's like, and she's like, honey, I'm going to go to Atlanta. And she never looks. She goes, don't come back. Oh. Right? So, okay. So <laughs> this gets to be a crazy story, too. You learned that from Bowie, too, oh, yeah, so, to pay for the room. So, oh, room. yeah. So so we get, we get to Atlanta, and then I knew this guy had never gone out of town because we got to the He goes, like, look at that hotel. And I go, yeah, that's a red roof, bro. It's like it's four story. It's it's not that big a deal, but okay, great. So so we so we do the show and these strippers who like the band, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah, right. So so I like, well, I'm married, I ain't doing anything, but I got this friend Orville. Oh no. So we got oh, this guy drinking beer, smoking weed, you know, and we get these we go, do so oh, these man. girls come in, do the dance in the room, this guy comes back. That was the best time I've had in my <laughs> life. Damn, just call me. You don't got to pay me. <laughs> and I'm sure 20, 30 years later, this guy is still telling that story to his friend. Like, <laughs> you should have seen them boys. They took care of me. Like, yeah, so, yeah. So, and, and he's uh, not married to that lady anymore. I don't know. He probably <laughs> still is. But, you know, but this guy had never gone more than 10 miles out of town his whole life. Yeah. Wow. You know, maybe hunting or fishing. That was wow. it. But, yeah, so. Yeah, I never forget the story. It was so funny, and you know, they did. So you got to watch Terry Bozio play drums. Yes, multiple nights. They he liked they liked our. We, we, we did twice two it tours with them. You know, two short tours. Wow. They because they, they it was just a good thing when we came up. Uh, we were like a good enough band to get the crowd going, and then they just took it to the next level. You yeah. Know? And uh, but he like the first time he had all Rota Sons, uh, Rota Sound, and Hot R- Rota Toms, Rota Toms, yeah. and they were hot dotted, and he had like. Two symbols, like two like two rides, like two crashes, and you get this thing with this double bass. And you go, yep. And, and did he like, stand up when he stood up? The it double was bass? so <laughs> fast. It was like, but but every day he came out of his bus, he had a pad and a rudiment pad and his practice sticks. Wow. Yep. Every day yep. he practiced. The people that get to that level, that's what they do. Yeah, I mean it was just amazing, you know. Just, and nicest guy. I mean, like one time I was like, we had got some bad food and stuff, and I was like, and I. We had to go on, so I, I threw up, washed my mouth oh, out. No. I went up, did like did our set, <laughs> had to go and, I, and I ran out the thing. I threw my guitar on the road, and it went out. <laughs> Terry's walking up. He goes, Tim, you okay? I'm like, oh, man. It's like, Terry, go away, man. Like, no, that's not good. <laughs> okay, so, I don't but, want you to see me on yeah, this. Like, yeah. But, uh, you know, and all the guys in that band were from, like, Frank Zappa's band. Yeah. The bass oh, yeah. player, cool. you know, and the Guerrero, and like, all those guys. So, I mean, they were really. The best of the best. But, and it was funny because. They were playing like super, like eighth note pops. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, you know, well, they're I'm, making I, money. Yeah, making money. Making I'm, money I'm sure they're Zappa. looking like this is the, mo-, you know. But yeah, so it was it. But I was great. They were great to play with. Um, we had a great time. We we were managed by um, E.G. Music, and they had Roxy Music and uh, King Crimson at the wow. time. So hmm. um, that was really cool. You know, we got to meet those guys. And um, Sarah, do you even know who they are? Uh, Be honest. I mean, Roxy I've heard music. of them, but. I yeah. couldn't tell you anything that Avalon, Roxy well, Music, King, King Crimson was uh, yeah, uh, Bruford, right? Bill Bruford. Well, Bruford was from he was like with Yes, but he went. I think he, and went, he, went, he yeah. went a little bit. Well, yeah. a lot of drummers play with King Crimson. Yeah. I, I know drummers. How old sorry. was I at the time? One, uh, maybe. My not. Well, <laughs> well, actually, my first concert. I was 13 years old. I was out in California with my cousins. We were at a wedding, and they go, "Hey, there's some bands playing down the street." And I go, "Oh, well, yeah, cool." So I'm thinking. Local bands, yeah, right. You know, no, no. It's Newport sixty nine. Oh. I go there. Grassroots come on. The Who played, and oh then and, and then I'm watching these like amplifiers. One, two, three, four, five, six. Jimi Hendrix comes out. I was gonna no. say, Hendrix. yeah, it's like, and he comes out and he's like, I really, I know, I'm really sorry, I really messed up last Friday, but I'm gonna make it up. So he's playing. Eric Burden comes out, and that's right when he busted out was sixty nine, I think. Yeah, oh, and he's because you know, he he was well, like, I was a. I was really a dr- I was really a drummer, huh. so of course like really? you know yeah I was like mm, fire I let you fire I mean come on I was like 
like it used to be Wipeout, and then all of a sudden Mitch Mitchell came on the scene. Yeah, there was no more Wipeout. <laughs> no, it's, it's all Mitch Mitchell wow. now. So that's how I started. And the reason I started bass, because <laughs> that old band, there's a, a band I was in, I was going to play drums, and they didn't need a bass, they didn't need a drummer. So I said, and I was playing sort of acoustic guitar, and they go, you play bass? I go, yeah. Yeah. You <laughs> do? Would well, do you have one? Yeah. So my <laughs> friend's grandfather won a guitar at Palisades Park Amusement Park for darts in a balloon. Wow. Awesome. That's a great right? darts in okay. a balloon gift. So we, so we take, so we take a... <laughs> Hacksaw, hack off because it made it four. <laughs> Put bass strings on it, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a bass guitar. Man, I that was would it. Love to wow! See a picture. Oh, a like, picture of that would be awesome. I, I I wish I had a picture of that. And then, and then you know we did more. And his, but his brother was a uh, a professional bass player. You know, played with the guys like from. Uh, um, Oh, I can't think of anything. Like Tower of Power kind of stuff like that. Oh, you know, cool. Yeah, really good. Bobby Piazza. So the Bay Area. And he, oh. and he was like a, fa- uh, like a fu- he was like the first fuzz bass. Mm-hmm. You know, that was his, you know, his thing. But, yeah, he's really good. And I had a, he had his, uh, I let, he get, let me use his uh, old Sun amp, little bass amp. You know, you turn the thing over and, you know, the amp yeah, comes yeah. in. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so. Well, the, the funny thing about fuzz bass that you just said, the new, the theme song for for our show here. I played my mom's bass and put a distortion on it, <laughs> and I loved it. I'm addicted to that sound now. It's awesome. It's, yeah, so it's it's fun. So that's how I started playing, and then uh, so we go, and then yeah, it was. I mean, I've had a great turn, and then um, then after like a couple bands, then Neighbors and Alice got back together again. We had something with oh. Island Records, but the guy that that gave us like a small like a uh, like a ten thousand dollar thing, like do a demo, advance you know, thing, yeah. advance, and they had like first red refusal, and the guy that he was the I guy hate that. that. He did new, new music seminar stuff. He was like the guy that ran it. Then he died of a cocaine heart attack. Oh, oh man! And, every, and like so, when somebody dies, everything dies. Everything's like, gone. Now yeah. we're not doing just bad blood, you know. So yeah. So mm. I did a couple and Hollywood years. Hollywood too and was the I, same thing. Yeah, and so I, I was writing like, I was still writing songs and stuff, but you know, but not doing like I, what I was. Well, in these bands, um, were you writing the songs too? Mm-hmm. Some okay. yeah, the rescue yeah. was it like a group thing or? Well, um, me and, and the rescue was me and Paul McGovern writing the songs. Okay, and then um. Uh, the Neighbors and Allies uh, was me, Jimmy, and uh, uh, Scott Simon. So you know. in, it, it, starting in the 70s, you actually have been established as a songwriter because the rescue actually, I mean, yeah. that got pretty big. Well, I, I'm not, you know, I mean, we, it's like, say, in pockets, you know, the people liked it, you know, stuff like that. And messages, you know, got in a lot of radio stations. Um, we had a single in Tell Me Now was the single in England, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, I saw the huh. album online. I'll put yeah. it up on the screen. Oh, yeah. Um, with the the two hits on it yeah. and, and you know well, that was, mm-hmm. classic well, 80s album cover well that, well that was that was like we were, we were taking the photo shoot for this and our manager put us on this tour from hell that was like every bad club owner oh. like they were meaner like you know here's in your the dinner. 80s it was tough too here's your pizza and a six pack here's your dinner like you uh. know you do like two months three months of that so we come back like dude really what the heck you know it's like <laughs> and he's like he's ah i'm trying to tough you guys up he goes but stop crying he goes like in like in two weeks you're opening for duran duran at brenda burn arena oh, so we wow. went from wow. crap club to twenty five thousand seater like in a week wow. so, so yeah it was, it was, it was and have you played in front of that many people by then no that was the wow, first time was so it was like yeah it's just like and it was and it was funny because they a lot of people didn't think we were going to do so well you mm-hmm. know what i mean okay but we pulled it off and we were like you guys we did good. Like we're like, well, we do practice a lot, you know. It's like we are a signed band. I mean, you know. So well, on the rescue stuff, it sounded like synth bass. Was it? Were you? Was it program uh, bass? Or some of it, it was. Some of it was a real bass. So, yeah, like uh, you know, um, tell me now was a real bass. Uh, you know, um, the talk song. Um, I'm a fan now. I'm gonna go back <laughs> and listen to this. I like it. Totally yeah, 80s, it's yeah. really good. And 80s are back now. Maybe you should do some remixes. I, <laughs> I can't find Paul McGovern. Oh, I don't. I don't really? know if he's still alive. I just. I've been looking for him on Facebook. Oh, oh man! And I yeah, just you know, with wow. Facebook, you'd find and I can't, anybody. And I can't find him. And it's, but he's from England, so I don't know if he went back. You know, but he was like really good friends with Nick Lowe and stuff. We did some good cool. gigs. It was like the guy. You know, let me think. Well, he did Mike and the Mechanics. Uh, he was the singer in that one. He sang "How Long." The guy sang "How Long." Oh yeah. Um, oh yeah. And he also did um, um, "Tempted." He tempted. Said, yeah. He said, squeeze. Said, uh, that guy. Well, that he he he, he wasn't all. He, name? I can't remember. But he, so he was the singer, and it was Nick Lowe, you know. Yeah. Love the sounds of Breaking Class, that one. Yeah. So we, so we had a gig. It was like Blue Angel, who was... Um, Paul, Paul Carrick? No. Paul Carrick was the guy. Paul Carrick. Yeah, he was the singer. I was going through wow. my head like crazy. I know Good this job. guy. I know this yeah. guy. Yeah. Who's um, the one, uh, Girls Want to Have Fun. 
Cindy Lauper. Yeah, Cindy, Cindy Lauper. Was yeah, the, she was the one. She was she was the uh, was us. Cindy Lauper. She was in a band called Blue Angel, and then and then it was Nick Lowe. Wow. You know what I mean? And it was like and this Paul. He knew all these guys. You know, like in the. So you know, back in the day, and so it was like so. So we had, we had a, we had like That's a cool, cool group. Yeah, That's so weird because I've worked with you in the studio a couple of years ago. I played drums on your last record. Actually. It was awesome too. Yeah, and mm-hmm. uh, thank God. It's easy to play drums on good songs. <laughs> Trust me. And it's great to have a great drummer. Just want to say, <laughs> the metronome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, but oh, what was my point? It was right there. And you played drums on the latest single coming in. That's right. That's right. That's right. Stardust. Yeah. Stardust. I have yeah. figured out when you're playing drums on songs. I recognize you can tell my drum- drummers. Yes. Oh, that's funny. Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, what was I going to say? We worked together. Oh, when, when we worked together mm-hmm. on uh, the record, I had no idea about all of the '70s and '80s stuff that you did. Oh yeah. yeah. No, I just I'm like, well, here's a country songwriter. He's mm-hmm. good. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that you really put your heart into this yeah I mean, I mean, well, I, the really thing is working at i mean i literally i tell you when i was five years old i was taking piano lessons and i would do the lesson that she taught me and then i go and i wrote this she goes you wrote this i go yeah i wrote a song <laughs> so it's, it comes and it's like you know i have i have a lot of um my 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 great grandfather um clinton pitcher he was one of the first all women's orchestras in ohio and he was a painter and but he played his violin all the way to his 95 i mean this guy wow. was old when i was five he yeah, goes yeah he saw lincoln <laughs> he's like what? Yeah, when I was a boy, I saw President Lincoln. I'm like, what? I'm like, man, that's creepy. <laughs> I know that is creepy. Yeah. But it was so cool, and he was and he was the coolest guy, man. And every day, like he had to put a tie on every day when he used to paint houses, and then he had a tie on, and he put it overhauls, and he'd do his stuff, and then he was done. His overhauls went off, and he's all dressed. That's wow. old school. Yeah, it's old, old school. school. Old, old school. Old love school. it. But he played his violin all the way to his 95. A song would come on the radio, and you go right with it, all the way in his 90s. Wow. I have that violin, too. It's awesome. I want to ask Sarah, do you have any questions about the 70s? Because I'd like to move on. There's, you have so much <laughs> life yeah, in there. Yeah, I'm thinking ahead a little bit. So. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Sarah. <laughs> well, one of my questions was, actually, you had brought up that he's, you were thinking that he was a country. Yeah, when I... When, because that's how I knew you were right. a country-based storyteller. Do you right. consider yourself to be a country artist or? No, I'm not a country artist. Okay. I was going to say, I didn't. I don't really think I'm, that you I'm more are. Americana. Like, I'm yeah. sort of like that between Beatles and Petty and yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, mm-hmm. storytelling. But I love, I love country music, the good songs that really tell a story. I mean, you know, you listen to some of those Jeffrey Steele songs, like, going, you know, like, you know, um, like that one, like, you know, turn it up. And there's like two verses and it describes this one guy, like, you know, golden tooth, lost his brother in the water. I mean, like, in an eight lines, it is, you can see this person, mm-hmm. you know his background, you know his, uh, what he believes in religiously, he knows, you know, where he's going. And that's that's the magic of it, because in a couple lines, you can actually visualize this person in your in your mind. Well, right. you, you do that very well um, in, in your song, Miracle. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. That was recorded by Cash Creek. I have the lyrics right here. I mean, you you can say them if you want, but yeah. holy cow! Yeah, that's that, that's a true story too. That happened. In fact, you know that this is I don't know if people know, but um, uh, I lost my eighteen-year-old son in a car accident, and it was of course you know it was totally devastating. And um, very and devastating. about ten years later, I mean ten uh, days later after the funeral, these single white flower grew, and it hadn't been in our yard. We've been at the house about ten years. We found out it only actually grows in the swamp. So um, my wife called me up. And we, his name was my son was named Trevor, Trevor. So we called it Trevor's flower. And a couple of days later, my wife went out, and the original flower closed up, and there was a circle of five white flowers, just like the first one. And uh, we went out, and uh, so she went to call me, and she got to the phone, and the phone rang, and it was the nurse from the organ donation said, "I just want to tell you that five people's lives were saved from your son's gift." You know. So and then then the flowers went away. We hadn't seen them in ten years, and it was like ten <laughs> years right. to the day to the. It was uh, the day of the accident. It was uh, May 7th coming mm-hmm. up. Was, uh, and uh, we went out, and that single white flower was there just for a day. Came back after 10 oh years Oh, my later. gosh. That gives me chills. <laughs> so, and it, he wrote a song about it. Yes, yeah, Miracles. And the thing, oh, my God. And the reason you know, I wanted to write that song, I wrote with my friend Bruce Miller, the thing um, that miracles happen every day. People don't want to think they do, and mm-hmm. they really do. You know what I mean? They do. And so I wanted to, you know, show that that like there's, and it was so beautiful because it wasn't like some giant thing. He said, "I love you. I'm gonna take five flowers, small white flowers, and you're gonna know." That's all it took, you know. So it's like, and sometimes even time I tell the story, the time it sort of chucks you up. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Like, you know, yeah, and you know, it's something that you never, you know, you never get over. I mean, there's, 
there's a song I write I wrote called Hold On. It's like about the day after it happens. And it's like, you know, you just, you know, it's every little thing. Like my wife said, the worst thing was when she went to the grocery store for the first time after he died and all the things that he loved, she passed in the arms. Jumped right out at her. Yeah, you know what I mean? So it's like, yeah. But there's joy back, you know what I mean? And we, we've had a lot of, you know, um, um, some uh, incredible experiences, you know. And uh, Can um, you read this? I, I want the people to hear that that lyric the story you just told uh where is it where, the uh, top one. Oh, the miracle yeah miracle. <laughs> not, not the three shots of whiskey <laughs> 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 you do that later uh they buried their son on saturday he was barely 18 um uh the next day one white flower grew the one they'd never seen it never should have grown there in a cold and stony soil but um uh, but they took it for a miracle, a message from their boy. Sometimes we don't know why things happen and happen like they do. Sometimes uh, uh, we cannot find the rhymes or reason hidden in the ruins. Sometimes it's not for us to know. Sometimes the mystery is shown. Sometimes out of rocks and rocky ground, miracles are found. And that's it. Yeah, man. Uh, I, and that, and I, and I also love the one about you know the uh, first time a blind girl sees her first sunset. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. All I mean, right. At that, uh, I I need a break. <laughs> um, and uh, we're gonna take a little break uh, from our uh, word from. I can't even talk. <laughs> we need to take a uh, sponsor break right now. We'll be right back with uh, Tim McGeary and I can't even speak. This is Music Studio Live. All right, we're back, everybody. Um, I'm a little happier now. I cleared my eyes a little bit. <laughs> we have a little bit of time, and I want to talk about the songs that we recorded today. Okay, mm -hmm. right. Um, so we'll Stardust, let's start mm -hmm. with that one, and we'll play that one first. Okay. Or, well, I don't know. It depends on where we are in the, right. in the podcast, where we'll play it. But Well, I wrote that with my uh, two writers, Scott and uh, Donna. Scott Barrier and Donna DePopo. And um, I met them through, uh, I was doing a song right around. And they came, they saw me play, and I said, hey, let's write one, and then we and came up with this. And the theme is like, um, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty spiritual person, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And the thing is like, you know, we, everyone wants to separate us, like, you know, it's the you know, Republicans and, you know, the liberals, and, you know, you're, we really want all the same stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. We want to have a hot meal, we want to be a nice house, we want opportunity, we want health care. You know, I mean, it's like, of course we want that stuff. Happiness. You know? And, and mm -hmm. happiness, I mean, like, and in, in, in be fulfilled. So we're not as far apart as everyone wants to make us out to be. Mm -hmm. So the Stardust thing, you know, just we all come from Stardust. Right. When it comes down to it. That's the basic yeah. building. I mean, that's, I mean, that's it. So, like, you know, it's like you, can, you can do all you want in those separating stuff, but we're all from the same place. You cool, know what man. I mean? So, so, so that's how the song comes in. I really, and I totally, I totally believe that. I mean, do this traveling stuff we're doing, my wife and I, you know, and uh, the more you see of the world, the more you see. And I did a lot of traveling as a merchant marine, you know, so I went, and mm -hmm. I I went to places like, you know, Pakistan and India and, you know, and Mogadishu and you know, wow. Ethiopia and Sudan and stuff. That'll and be the next podcast. We'll talk yeah. about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but, um, you know, you, you see that stuff and, you know, the, and the, the world's a great place and there's so many wonderful things that you can see, even though, like, you know, um, you pick out, you know, different stuff, but everyone has some beauty you know, something that they can... We're all the same here. We're all the same. Whether right. our minds have changed it Yeah, or not. and we all come mm -hmm. from the same space. We all come from the one source. It's yeah. not like in different sources, you know. I, I think, like, you know, the, the, the guy of the universe going, like, what are you doing down there? Yeah. <laughs> like, come on. <laughs> it's me. That's it. Let's cut the stuff. Yeah. You know. Well, uh, let's take a quick break here for uh, another sponsor break, and okay. then uh, we'll play some music. And okay. uh, we'll come back. Be sure and visit our website at musicstudiolive.com. There you'll find all of our social media links. You're tuned in to Music Studio Live. Every story has two sides. You got yours, I got mine Wasting time throwing stones Giving fear and hate a home We live, we die, we laugh, 
Studio Live. Tim, I want to talk to you about your upbringing a little bit. Your dad was an FBI agent? He was an FBI agent for 12 years, and, and then he opened his own business. Cool. Yeah. What could he tell you about? Has he told uh, you anything about that? Yeah, well, he had, he had a great time. I mean, like, <laughs> they got away with a lot of stuff. Wow. <laughs> mm, funny. This but is 70s? This is way before. Oh, no, 60s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, um... But I, I remember he used to take me to the uh, FBI gun range, which when I was a little kid, and like they were using wow. Tommy guns. I was like, oh, that's wow. the coolest thing ever. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm five. It's like, you know, yeah. like you know, the guys are shooting me. You know, and, they, and they had all these, like, uh, they were painted red. They had no, so they didn't have no, hmm. um, you know, they were like guns to, to show you how to, like, to clean or whatever you had okay. to do with them. So, of course, like, I got to pick up a real, it was, a you know, didn't have a firing pin in it or anything like that, but it was like a real Tommy A real gun, gun. Yeah. I thought it was like, yeah, then. But we never he and we never saw his gun. Oh, never saw it at the house. Wow. You know, but we had like ten kids. I'm the oldest of ten. Oldest of what? ten. What? Yes, I have five sisters named Mary. Yes, Mary. I read that. That was. What are Mary, all their names? Mary Colleen, Mary Ann, Mary Joan, Mary Patricia, Mary Catherine. <laughs> and every year they get together, they have the Merry Weekend. <laughs> awesome. So once a year, yeah. Irish yeah. Catholic, I'm assuming. I, I very <laughs> Irish Catholic. <laughs> Timothy, Sean, Brian, yeah. Why? Michael Sean. Were they all named Mary? Well, I think the story I got is my mom had a miscarriage, so she said, Dear Virgin Mary, if I have any more girls, I'll name them Mary. All of them. So, you know, and I... So, <laughs> and she did. So, I think know. I would take that back. Well, I also had a brother, Kevin, that was killed by a car when I was three and a half. What? Yeah, he was two, and I was three and a half, got run over. And I was, you know, I remember that, you know. You saw it happen? Yeah, yeah. I, my mom, wow. I was, uh, That's terrifying. I remember um, seeing the... Uh, people putting blankets over him and the uh, umbrellas, you know. Um, so that was a, this is a little part because I'm 30 years sober and I had a lot of anger issues. And what happened was when you're three and a half, you don't know how to grieve. Right. right. And uh, what happened is like when, so my, when my brother died, he lived like about eight or eight hours later, but he had brain damage and he passed Oof. away. So, oh, um, so my parents put me to someone's house and they, me and my brother, I remember playing with him in the crib. We do this thing. We like, rock the crib my parents would come in and when they come in 
<laughs> fake the slit and they go out and we Aww. run, you know, stuff, you know. <laughs> so uh, I remember doing it. And um, so what happened was that when I, they, when I came back, they had taken everything of Kevin's out of the house and we never talked about it. Like they'd even put a headstone until my dad's mom died and they buried her and Kevin together. Yeah, I mean, the headstone. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So that so, would play head games with you? So wow. the thing is, yeah, so I had like, you know, where's my brother? And I was three and a half, so I'd been mad. <laughs> and I was always like, yeah. so like, and then I had like, you know, these like, my mom said the worst, this uh, kindergarten teacher, Mrs. Ostergren. <laughs> and she would put these <laughs> coloring. And if I went out the line, she'd put a big red X on it like that. So she sits me next to this little girl. She goes, now look how nice she colors. And I spit on her paper. <laughs> so, so my parents knew right then. And know, then you were in a punk rock band 10 years later. Wow. Yeah, so yeah, it, it, all, it, sort of, it all made sense. I mean, all my brothers and sisters are super straight, like, you know, you know blazers and khaki pants play golf oh you're the black Funny. sheep and i'm the oldest and the, you black, are sheep. I'm the, the black sheep i'm the racker you know got tattoos like oh my god my dad still goes what's all those tattoos i go dad i'm 63 if i want to have a tattoo guess what <laughs> yeah do you're it. doing it and by the time and i had these late so i said by the time these look bad i'll be dead so it's okay yeah <laughs> but you're not okay. a black sheep because you're a really awesome guy and very uplifting well, spirit and sarah they you, must be very proud of you yeah well i mean you know i, I mean the thing is just to get out of a crack i was a crack cocaine addict you know this wow. is 30 years, 30 years ago. ago i was like 150 pounds well, like congratulations on your sobriety and the thing is and really the the the, the odds you get now is like four out of a hundred mm -hmm. so just that's a miracle yeah you know? what was the breaking point for you that actually made it so you realized that you had to make a change i was gonna pawn my wedding ring for a crack and the guy <sighs> said tim go home and so i got suicidal and uh wow. I was, and i and i was almost gonna run my car into a, a bridge you know like a an, you know and uh this voice says, no, Tim, get help. I think wow. it's my brother, Kevin. He, my brother, Kevin, has been around me the whole time. Wow. I've, I've, I've had psych, like one time I'm playing a gig and this lady goes, I don't know how to tell you this, but you have a this tall blonde kid that keeps on dancing around you when you're playing. Kevin's always been there. You know, wow. you know what I mean? And, I just uh, got to chill. I yeah, like I love <laughs> stories like this. Yes. If you have any more, please Oh, tell we me. have a lot of them, yeah. Oh. Well, I mean, basically what happened, I'll tell you what happened. This is because you're you were going to talk about like how do you get over the situation, right? And, you know that and um, being a paramedic and I was a flight medic, so I had a lot of terrible accidents, you know. And I, and I really have this thing that you know when your time's up, your time's up, you know mm -hmm. what I mean. And sometimes you actually it's it's preordained before you come down. But um, we had a friend of ours. I would I had uh, taken this kid that was shot in the chest um, um, on the helicopter, and he he passed away. He was a three you know, three. three 387 to the chest you're you're, you're not gonna yeah, you're not gonna make it so um but um she there's a lady who's a medium and this lady is like she never charges money it's just, just a gift so uh, it was about 10 days later and we were like you know we were, i mean look we were i was a mess and um i was on the the uh, massage table because i was i was getting massaged then for this back thing and uh uh, the lady said, you know, Tim, she goes, you haven't cried. Because I was doing all the man things like, you know, the, mm -hmm. organ, you know, the organ donation, the funeral home and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, you weren't, and you didn't really process it all the way. Right. And sure. so, so she goes, let it go. So, of course, for the whole hour, I wept on the, t you know, the whole time. But I needed to do it. So during that time, I'd, this, uh, I'd heard that the, the day, that day before of my friends, like this friend, that can, you know, she'll call you. So I got home. And, the, and during the thing, I'm saying, Trevor, I said, we are a mess, man. I mean, we just need to hear, you know, you're there and okay. So I get home, and I wasn't home like 10 seconds, and the phone rings. She goes, okay, this is, I won't say your name, but like, because I don't know if she wants me to on sure. the blog, but she said, I don't know what your religious beliefs are. And I said, well, I'm open. So mm -hmm. she said, okay, well, I was going to call you later, but Trevor's here, and he says, I need to talk to you right now. So she said all these things, like, in my, you know, and she says, write, you know, write them down. Did she know Trevor's name? Or? No. Yeah. Wow. She knew nothing. Wow. She, and she, she she thought I was going to call me after five, but she said I because I thought I was working. Mm -hmm. So um, she hangs up, and then she calls right back, and she goes, Trevor knows you don't really believe this. No, I never went to a psychic. I thought it was always baloney. And she goes, but he goes, tell Mommy and Daddy I'm with the man with the funny hats. Now, Carol's real father wasn't much. He didn't really fit the bill. He didn't even show up. But she had this Uncle Lou that she was very close to, and he was like more like a dad, mm -hmm. you know. 
and uh and what happened like when we first started dating we got like uh every year like we had like christmas or birthday we'd give him a present and a, and a silly hat mm-hmm. and in his kitchen he had like tw- you know, a whole rack of these funny hats well he had died 12 years before that from cancer Wow. No one knew no that. No one would know that. You can't look wow. that up. You know what I mean? So, and she's a, many other things, too. I mean, you know, so I've given her name to a lot of people. I, I want it. her name. <laughs> not, okay. Not right now. When we're, yeah, yeah, yeah. When we're not and she's really cool. And and the whole thing is like, and so I've, and, uh, but I've had like, when I when I got his uh, box, of, I got his ashes, right? And I was sitting on the bed and uh, I saw that I felt this thing go like, wham to black, wham to black. And like, and I could see the, I saw the accident, like the, the van hitting him. And went right to black, because I was always saying like, "Were you ever in pain?" Mm-hmm. And, and and right after that happened, this person calls me. She goes, "Trevor just showed you the accident, right?" And I go, "Yeah." And he goes, "Wow." He just wanted to make sure that you knew he was never in pain. Van to black. Yeah, I mean, yeah, van. And then when I saw wow. the pictures of the van that hit him, that was in the vision that, that I got. You know. So then the other thing is, and this is the other one. This is the crazy one. So there was a guy named. This Pinoche. is the crazy one. This is the crazy. <laughs> Panash Desai, he had this like an all-day seminar, and um, so I went. And so the first, and what, what it was that like, you had a discussion, and then you meditated, right? So the first one, you know, he says the second one was like your affirmations are really good, but like you have all this, like say if, if your cups thir- three quarters filled with mud, you can't get anything into it, you know what I mean? So you have to release that, and that's like pain, guilt, and I had all this pain from Travis about a year mm-hmm. after it happened, mm-hmm. and I knew it wasn't good for me or my family or anyone around me right. at work, so I needed to, and I wanted to get rid of it, so. So we started doing the meditation, and he walked over, and he put his hand on my stomach, my head, and then over my heart chakra. And as soon as that, I whipped. Like somebody took a cork out of the bottle, and I wept like a baby, like from the bottom of my soul, like from my brother mm-hmm. and my wow. son. He, then he took his hand off. I stopped. Put his hand on my stomach, my head again, over my heart chakra. Again, I started weeping. So then he walked away, and I got this vision of this person. And this is, this is the crazy part now. So this person is, I tell you, Long black hair, huge beard, um, in his jeweled robe with his hat to sort of match. And, and, and in the front, there was like all these like shadows of people. Like this, is, they wanted to be there at this point. But I wasn't supposed to focus on them, supposed mm-hmm. to focus on him. Mm-hmm. And this whole time I was saying, I want to release my pain. And, I could, and this is like a long vision. And as he, st- he started stepping forward, getting closer to me, and his hand reached out and touched my forehead. And I could feel it. And all the pain that I had for my son was gone. Wow. It was, it was like... You know, so I told somebody, he goes like, you're an older soul. <laughs> You've been around here before because you don't get that much. So I go, well, I don't know. I said, and I, so, I mean, and those, and all those things and, and other things of, you know, Trevor coming in and like one time we were, we were going because he died just before he graduated. And so they didn't have anything in the yearbook. So the next year they wanted to put something in the yearbook. Mm-hmm. So my wife, so we got to the front door of the school and my wife started to break down. And this lady called, it goes like, I don't know where you guys are. But and I was, you know, but Trevor like said I needed to call you right now just to make sure that it's gonna be okay. Mom. Wow! He tell his mom. So I mean, we've had so many like <laughs> I'm blown away. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I want to hug you right now. It's so been bad. really <laughs> hard to keep it together right yeah. now. I'm, so the thing yeah. is, I mean, I so we've been, but so, and the thing, the joy is, it does take time. I mean, there's no two ways mm-hmm. about it, you know. And, and that's the worst thing we say to somebody. Like people go like, what can you say? To somebody to? just say I'm with you. Whatever you need, I'm there. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Because you can't say, "Time here is all well. wound." You don't want to hear it. You don't no. want to hear it. You, 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 you don't need want to hear to stop that. You need to change your ways. You know. Yeah, that, yeah, that no, doesn't help. Anything. Not that. You know. I mean, one lady came to my wife. She goes like, "Well, at least you have do- two daughters left." What? Yeah, she's wow. like, I'd like. <laughs> Did you write a song about that lady? <laughs> no, it, it wouldn't be nice. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, but but the thing is, like, you know, we we you know, my wife and I. And when through my drug addiction, we were we're still married. You know what I mean. And uh, I mean, I have, have awesome. met this awesome woman. Mm-hmm. I mean, I met her one time. The whole the way I met her, I was my friend used to work at this restaurant when he was a kid, and it was Mother's Day, and the, the, one of the cooks called out. So the the owner knew him and just said, "Do you know anybody who cooks?" And I used to cook. I said, "I could do broiler, stick, whatever you want." And he goes, "I need somebody to do the broiler." And I came in, and she was waiting table. So I worked there one day. Wow. And she was there, and then so we'd never been apart. And so, thir- you know, it'll be uh, 38 years this year of November. Oh, my. Congratulations. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> awesome. Wow. Yeah. So, and so, and we sort of figured out that, you know, um, if we stick close to each other, like, no matter what happens, we can get through it mm-hmm. together. Absolutely. You know what I mean? And I think, you know, we've been through a lot of stuff, you know, because my daughters had a really hard time and they went through some really tough situations with us. And, you know, they're, now they're, they're on the other end of that. We're you have start- two daughters? Yes, two daughters. Okay. 35 and 36. And, um... 
Like saying, like, you know, God gives you anything you can handle. Dude, I'm really not that strong. I need a break. Come on. Mm-hmm. I mean, like. Yeah, but you are like, that strong. Well, yeah, I guess I am. You, you are know, now. I mean. Yeah, I mean, I. I yeah, on that I, side I, of it. I'm on that side of it. So, you know, now it's. So now I'm, you know, retired as a firefighter paramedic. You know, I was up at ground zero. Um, I did want to talk to you about that. Yeah. I, we're, this is going to be a three-part <laughs> podcast, I think. <laughs> so uh, I was at the DMAT team. Um, we did two two missions. One is the, was the, was the ground zero at 9-11, and then we worked for the vic- uh, Katrina victims. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Um, but the, the 9-11 was the one because, you know, we were, we were in New Jersey, and I, you know, I worked in New York. My dad is office on 42nd. So that's Lives. before you were down here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. No, 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 no. I was down here, but I was. But you, I was because a teen. you were from Jersey, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And uh, my dad, when he he left the FBI and started one of the first dental clinics with this doctor, and so they got all these unions, and they made they, it was a great story, and they made a lot of money, and it was mm-hmm. you know it was fun. But um, so what happened was like so we you know we go to Chinatown all the time. We took our kids to top of the world trade centers, you know, and that was as we went. And um, so when that happened, so it, it was part of this thing called the the DMAT, which is the Disaster uh, Medical Assistance Team which is the federal thing, and they it's like a mass unit. We have, like, doctors, pharmacy, everything. And we just went up and set up a tent, and um, you know, right on ground zero. Wow. But I remember the first day we walked in, and they, they get a little debriefing, and they say, listen, when you see this, it's going to sort of blow your mind mm-hmm. you know, when you see it. So we, we get there, and it's all these scene lights. It looked like a movie set, End of the World. Wow. And then there's, like, these little um, three-pronged uh, machines that were picking up steel, you know, and it was there was like six of them on the pile, and it's like they were like the way they were going around. It was like a ballet almost. It was like they were just <laughs> missing each other, picking stuff up, and uh, and then like you know you see, uh, I mean just the destruction like that. And then they'd have a uh, there was a the one that used to kill you. It made me cry every time. They had an engine that was um, badly damaged, but the air horn worked. So when they found a piece of one of the firefighters. The, that hair horn would go off. You know, they found something. Mm, and wow. then the guys from his house would go get that remains. And it was just like, wow. it, it, oh you know, just gosh. tore you up. And then we did the Katrina one where we went out. And uh, and I always say this and when I play out live because, you know, there's so much negative stuff. But so many people on the way there to Katrina, we were there. So many random acts of kindness, mm-hmm. like one after the other. Like, the funny story, we were like... Um, between Louisiana and Texas, and there was this like this place, and it was like it was a weird place. It had a gambling hall, hotel, gas station, restaurant. Mm-hmm. It was just it was like everything. But across the street was this, this, I guess, a bar, and it was like the whole thing of like roosters. And I, and it was a truck driver, and I go, I go, do they do like cockfighting there or something? And he goes, no, but that Tim, that place is a real bad place. He goes, when you go in there, they ask if you got a knife or a gun. If you don't have one, they give you one. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. So, but what happened? There was a there was a chemical spill on Route 10, and we we have they they directed us to go to um, San Antonio at Kelly Air Force Base because they flew 5,000 people there, mm. and uh, the, our our job was to take care of the 5,000 because we had a lot of people like you know so we had a I gave like 5,000 Hep A shots. People hated me, and then tetanus yeah. shots next. Ah, wow. wow. Yeah. So um, but it was you know but it was great to be part of something that helped people you know and that's mm-hmm. that's yeah. the thing when I went with paramedic when I when I got that job because. When I first came down here, I had a company, and the company went bust, and I bankrupted myself, lost everything we owned, our house and everything, my car. Wow. I remember you telling me yeah. about that. <laughs> what kind of company was it? Oh, it, it's sort of a complicated. This is back in, when you were doing mail order and, and visa cards. They, okay. They weren't compatible back then, not though they are today. <laughs> so uh, so it was, we, we sort of fixed, we had to try to fix that problem, but it didn't, it backfired and it got really, yeah. So Secret Service came to my house. I was like, yeah, I thought I was like, oh, Whoa. but what? we, but everything I did was it was above board. I, there was yeah. no trickery. There was no like I just every I had all the paperwork, you know, and everything was signed. And yeah. So it was there was no problems. But what happened? So um, uh, I was uh, I had to work two jobs. I worked the, the first watch, and I was like, you know, so I'd do a breakfast in the morning. So I'd get up wow. like four thirty in the morning, ride my bike, do that, come home, shower. My wife would go to that's really to her rock job. bottom. Ride that your is. bike. Oh yeah, and then I rode my bike to Sports Page. <laughs> You know, oh. <laughs> at nighttime, because pizzas from six. Yeah, we well, would turn to Stevie Tomatoes, Weekend Willies, whatever it's going to be. I don't know what it is today. So it was sports page back then, and, I would, oh, and I, so I cooked yeah. pizzas from six to one. So I didn't sleep, you know. Wow. But I had a wife and kids. I need you had to have money. You, you know, my, I was always wow. taught like you're Absolutely. the man. You you got to provide. How old some. were your kids at this point? They were young, probably really uh, young. ten. You know, oh. ten, twelve, like that. So, and uh, Trevor was like he was like five, I think, by that time. So. And but one of the girls, the witches, was going to EMT school, and I went, hmm, best job ever. I mean, I loved it. You know, I know a couple. 
Yeah, yeah. and yeah. it was it. But it's like the thing is, you do, you help people for a living, mm-hmm. right? And the retirement is kicking. <laughs> so yeah. So out of eight thousand people between Kyer and Lee of of county employees, I was the number one person in overtime. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, they had this thing Making in the paper. Making that pap- money. They had the, they had the pa- that thing in the paper, and they go, "Oh yeah, they got list everyone's name overtime. Let me see." Oh wow. God, like, <laughs> I'm number one. Hey, Dad, like, oh. I'm number one. It's like, all right, you finally did something. Oh, great. No, no, so, so, so. But, you know, I, I told my wife, I said, uh, you know, it, go, it went somewhere, it goes in your retirement. So I said, like, I'm just going to hard time it. So even, and, that's, and this is even me going to Nashville like four or five times a year for two wow. weeks at a shot, you know, mm-hmm. and that's when I started. What I did is up there, I, 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 I I written some songs and I sent this friend this fr- my friend Mike because we become really good friends. So back then he was a you know publisher, and so I sent him some songs and he wasn't too impressed, you know. Mm-hmm. So I was just in Nashville. We had done a, something in that we, <laughs> the name of my band back then was Wonderful Johnson. Wonderful Johnson. I did and we some had work for and we had and we had a gig with hmm. we, yeah you t- it's the artwork for you <laughs> yeah artwork for the, yeah, for the twelve CD. And we then we had a gig with, and it was us and Weekend and Wet Willie, Wet Willie and Wonderful, <laughs> and Wonderful Johnson, Johnson, same bill. I mean, oh yeah, wow. wow. I'm like, That's how do we put that together? Yeah. So uh, I go to Mike's office and I said, uh, Hey, listen, I'm in town in Nashville. And I said, Can I play? Uh, can I come in just see? And he goes, you, can, you got ten minutes. So he said, I came in. He goes, Get a guitar off the writer's room wall, play me one verse, one chorus, or one song, go. And I played, and he liked it. Let me hear something else. I played. And go, okay. Awesome. He goes. He goes. He goes. Uh, you got potential, but uh, you got a lot to learn. So he goes, he goes. So you got to start co-writing. You go, co-writing. He goes, yeah, like with other people. You know, like I don't want to give them uh, part of my song. Because I know, I, that's I know, hard. I know, I'm a songwriter. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'm going to tell you. When you go to Nashville, all of a sudden you get schooled. You yeah. know what I mean? And mm-hmm. uh, so I've been very fortunate um, with some some kinds of my that friend. That makes a lot of people leave Nashville. Yes. Right away. Well, it's it's tough. I mean, you got twenty thousand songwriters all vying for like two thousand cuts. Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm-hmm. So, and then I've met like Gary Hannon was become a friend of mine, and mm-hmm. he got me a lot of opportunities because I was on stage like Daryl Worley and Billy Dean and Richie McDonald. You know, it was like us three on stage. So, like, I'm next to the guys, and of course, like, you know, Richie would sing, and then goes Tim. Now you get to sing after Richie McDonald. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And of course, Billy Dean, and you know, and he was really nice guy. So, but like you say, those guys are really the guys that are good are always nice. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. And uh, so I got, and then I got a couple opportunities on the Island Hopper Festival. You know, I got mm-hmm. on that, and I, you know, and I got to do some stuff with Win Varble and uh, uh, Phil O'Donnell. I was going to say you wrote with Phil, right? Or I, I'm, I'm around Phil, or? but he knows you. I, I was. Yeah. <laughs> I moved to Florida. To be in a band with Phil, right, right, yeah, O'Donnell. yeah. They call yeah. him Phil Billy. Phil Billy, yeah. He's written and some really awesome songs, big songs too. Yeah, big, yeah, big songs. money. Great, yeah. great. What are some of the songs? Country can you say? guy. Well, he wrote um, uh, "What Do You Do When I'm Not Looking." That one, mm-hmm. right? Um, he wrote like uh, back when I was, you know, when I knew it all did, with, did, with him and Gary Hanna. Yeah, did Gary write uh, "Tequila, Tequila Makes Her Clothes, clothes Fall Off"? Yeah, <laughs> and that's and like, that's Joe Nichols. Joe Nichols, that. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. I opened yeah. for him. Oh, actually, that's one funny. Time, yeah. yeah, there you go. One more thing about Daryl Worley. Yes, I don't know if you know this, but my brother that passed away a couple of years ago was Daryl Worley's drummer. Oh, really? During nine, wow. during nine eleven. They played uh, the White House. Oh, wow. He wrote a song. Uh, uh, what was Daryl's big hit? If you forget, don't forget. Uh, uh, n- uh, I'm drawing a blank on it now. Uh, it was a big, huge American anthem at the yeah. time because of 9-11. It's, it's forget something about. Uh, but when Varble wrote that one. Oh, okay. Well, there when you Varble's go. When Varble was that, yeah. You know. So, so that, that, that's a interesting. Yeah. I forgot your door, Daryl Worley. Yeah. Um, We've got, he's got some fun. We have some funny footage on YouTube with that too, with that Crash Saltwater American. Cowboy song. Uh, yeah, it's like, it's like, <laughs> like yes, yeah, so I, I go square grouper. You know, people smoke it, and he goes, "I tried that with my turkey, but I couldn't get it lit." So I was like, "Yeah, it's like, <laughs> he's very, he's actually super smart. Like he got MCATs. He could have been a doctor." Wow. And he was like really smart. You know what I mean? Yeah. So he's not. Yeah. So you're tied in with some some good Nashville songwriters. It's taking me well. a while. Yeah. You know, and the thing is, it's it's a ten year town. Uh, mm-hmm. The thing is, uh, what I'm trying to do is be consistent. You know, when I mm-hmm. when I come up there to write with somebody, like, when the first three years when I got there, you know, of course, I was a learning thing. Sure. And I didn't write with like some big writers, and I'm glad I didn't because I wasn't ready. And it was funny. I called Mike. I go, Mike, I'm so glad I didn't. Write. He goes, He goes, I'm so glad you said that because so many guys don't get they it. They don't get yeah. it. You just got to do some time and get your legs, you know, and get you know the throw. But I wrote that song, American May, which has been cut by a bunch of people, and uh, I think that was the song to me that said, okay, I, I'm getting it. Mm-hmm. And so did he. So, 
And uh, so were you writing more stories at that point then? Um, I don't know. I mean, just like I mean, there's or some sort looking of like, for hooks or for for. for I'm stories. I'm a big chorus guy. Mm-hmm. I love mm-hmm. choruses. You know what I mean. But what I learned about in Nashville, like Gary Hannon actually told me this thing. He like he said one time. He goes like he says like twenty things, right? And he goes, "Now tell me back." And I'm like, Ugh. "He goes." Oh. Then he goes, "Now he says the twenty things with the storyline as you're going into a house, and you can almost remember almost all of them because you you follow the storyline as you're walking into the house. So and that was that's oh I get mm-hmm. it. So that you know he taught me that and. um so and a lot of guys I was working with, but like uh, you know, like not that way song. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? I, you know, it's like uh, three kamikaze, you know, two beers and Patron on ice. I thought you'd go and you know for the record on your birthday party that night. You lost your shoe. You lost your mind. You were dancing on the tables, um, singing redneck woman. You, you know, and it's like you can visually, see, visually, yeah. you can see this. I can woman, see myself. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> you know that and that that. So that was it. And that was it. So that I thought too, like okay, I'm, I'm getting it, you know that kind of stuff. I'm saying that people are getting, they can mm-hmm. see it, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, so, um, and then like you know, I just been, uh, you know, just you just get around and uh, be consistent, as in showing up on time, consistent. Oh, on, it's, like, a, up, it's a business. Mm-hmm. It's a business, and, right. and and also too, like you know, if I say, hey, I'm gonna give you two hundred dollars for this demo, you had the money, it wasn't like, oh, I'm gonna no, here's the money, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Yeah. I was always so like that. And then the other thing is to come with ideas, and which I liked about me being down here for a couple of months before I came up, I just load up with all kinds of like you know hook I you know choruses. So you go to Nashville ideas. prepared with right. a I, yeah. lot of ideas, and yeah. that's and and they like that because like say a lot of times they go in a room, they go, okay, what do you got? I don't know. What do you got? I just got up. I just got up. Yeah, I like, got nothing. I got nothing. Right. But I came and I go like, well, we got this, 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 and this, and that. And they go, oh, I like that one. Let's do that one. So they and they love that. Because it's like okay, yeah. we we starting with something, you know what I mean? You, you wrote with Casey Weston, our first. We guest. did, yeah. In fact, um, he uh, the uh, song "No One's Innocent," which is a funny song about a guy that thinks he's going to take advantage of a woman in a bad situation. Basically, she he was set up, and she steals everything he owns. Ooh. <laughs> that's yeah. a, that's about Casey Weston style. <laughs> yeah, that it? is. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, it was funny, and we and that, that she got her first Nashville cut with a band called Cash Creek. Yeah, so awesome. yeah, so it was good. And it was a you know it's a it's a it's a good feeling when you get to me. I feel like well you know. What kind of money are you making? And you know, I made more money on the TV shows and the, and the movies I've been. Yeah, on. you've had mm-hmm. uh, songs in Smallville, One Tree Hill, Glory Days, right? And HBO film, The Girl Gets Mo. Right, and there's a couple of small other ones stuff like that, like cool. uh, indies and stuff. Do you see see any royalties still? I still those? see. I still a little see bit. Right? That's I great. still see royalties from Smallville and uh, One yeah. Tree Hill. They still wow. play them in Europe and stuff. Well, I wrote for um, like Finland. Uh, yes, Finland. Uh, Oprah, <laughs> Oprah Winfrey theme. I played oh. drums and wrote a wow. se- segment for. Uh, Carrie Underwood. Oh, oh wow! Of that I forget the show. Oh, Oprah's. Uh, it's on YouTube. Awesome. But I also wrote for um, the Speed Network. Oh, which nice. Was owned by Fox, and I still get like forty-two cents from Japan. Right. Oh, it's funny. Really weird. Yeah, you get, you get these royalties, but it keeps the mailbox money is the most beautiful thing. It's amazing. Thing. Mm-hmm. When I was first getting it, like like these are like three or four thousand dollar checks coming in. Yeah. It's like every quarter, like. My wife is like, "What's in the mail?" I got it. Oh, it's a BMI check. What's how much? Oh, it's only a little bit. <laughs> Let me see it. Eh. It's like, because you know, you get a musician with three thousand dollars, you know where you're going. I'm going to Brent's. <laughs> so right, going to right. <laughs>
show you the way you should be. This is Music Studio Live. All right, we are back with Tim McGeary, and we're going to talk about the song. The Only Thing. The Only Thing. Yes. <laughs> he just told me the name of it. Well, I, I, the, uh, the guy, my friend Mike, I told you about the publisher. He put yes. me this guy, Bruce Collins. This guy's had a crazy life, and uh, what, had Mike met him, this guy escaped from jail. And somehow ended up in Mike's office, you huh. know, like yeah. And so Mike, I'm a songwriter. <laughs> yeah, and well, he actually, but he has he. You think I have stories? This guy's got great stories. Oh, so, my goodness. and um, so um, Mike convinced him to go back, turn himself back in, to finish his time. Really, he, he did. Mike is a pretty cool dude. Yeah. Oh, you, you, have, oh, you wow. have no idea. This guy, his his story is unreal. I mean, he used to be a um, work in the in the circus as a drummer. What? Wait, wait. So, the, the, the of course they're all friends, and the guy and one of the um, tightrope brothers fell and got killed. So, so Mike says like, man, because I'm so sorry. If there's anything I could do, I mean, if I could learn, I could do. And the guy goes, really? <laughs> and he goes, yeah. You're kidding me. He t- takes him right the back. They have like a two foot one. They practice and they teach him. You know, they do the thing. You know, then he takes him up, gets him 100 feet up, and he gets out. And he's like, they have one that goes down like on an angle. Yeah. And he goes, okay, take a step out. This is the first day, right? It's like, and he's like, I don't really want to go. He's like, he goes, do it. So he finally takes a step, and then take another oh. step. Now, once you take two steps out, you ain't, you ain't going backwards. No, you're no. not. So you got to go down. And he goes all the way down. He goes, oh, it's no bad. He goes back up, and that night he was in the show. Wow. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, yeah. That's so great. He, so, he, so he has all these things of him like walking over waterfalls and you know doing tightrope and stuff. And then he had a thing where he had a stretchy rope. So like he falls like on yeah. purpose. Yeah, and you know, I mean, people, ah! and it's like, dude, it's unbelievable. I mean, this guy. Wow. And this is yeah. the music publisher. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that oh. sounds completely boring compared to all this other stuff. Oh, this guy was also like you know when when uh, Leonard Skinner was really close to them. He was he mm-hmm. was he was their like like their tour manager guy. Oh, he's got a funny story. Like they had, a th- <laughs> they had this backdrop and it was used to blow away. So they put this huge pipe in there, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the, the drummer came off stage and hit it and knocked himself out. <laughs> oh. So the guy's waking up, Mike's over like, go like, go ahead, say it again. <laughs> say it again. Oh. <laughs> That'd be Artemis like, Pyle, I think. Oh my God, I, uh. I forget which, I forget which one. He just tells a story, it's like so funny, you know. Wow. Like, and, uh, but yeah, he's, and then when that plane crashed, he was the one person they asked to come into the, it was him. Wow. wow. Yeah, so he's, yeah, he's got all kinds of history, but and we become. Yeah. It was funny because, like, you know, it was like when we first started. It was like, Ugh, you know, but we become really good friends now. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, like, you know, and um, and uh, yeah, he, he's helped me in a lot of ways. There's a lot of sort of politics in Nashville that, if you don't know, you can get ripped up pretty. Like, you can't oh, yeah. say, you can't go like, "Hey, I'm a songwriter." And they go like, mm-hmm. mm, "Yeah, hit yeah. the road." But if they go like, "What are you doing up here?" I'm writing some songs. Oh, that. So they have to ask you first. That simple you, thing, mm-hmm. yeah. You can't tell them first. You have to let them ask you, and then they, then you can well, tell them. Being a musician, too, I had a guy come up last night and have his oh. friend ask if he could play drums. No. This happens all and, and the time. And the guy's staring in front of me, and I'm like, well, how come you didn't ask me to play drums? Right. And he was like, uh, it's like, well, they don't really let people sit in here. I'm sorry. Do you yeah. remember, <laughs> though, when yeah. I sat in with you guys at the Bay House? Yeah, my course. husband came up yeah, and asked yeah, he if did. I could sing with you. That's true. And we let you. You did let me. <laughs> and it was great. Well, I knew you were going to be good for some reason. I don't know. You she didn't was, even see she me. She was I, cute I, and, and she was, was a girl. Super, no, I, I was super was pregnant. pregnant. Oh. Super pregnant. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you, now, now I know. She's, you got the pregnant excuse. <laughs> she's pregnant. Let her sing. Come on. Even oh, she's bad. Oh, man. I guess well, we have to let her The way he put here. it, I believe the way he put it was, I know everybody tells you this all the time, yeah, but she said, actually yeah. is good. <laughs> and when he said it like that, I was like, oh, yeah, all right, yeah. let's try it. Uh, anyway. Great. I've heard that too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I have a quick question. Um, and I think a lot of our viewers and listeners mm-hmm. would probably wonder this too. How exactly do you make money in songwriting? Well, number one, uh, like in Nashville, most of the artists don't write their own songs. Right, you know right. I mean? So they get then, they, they, but they have great songwriters, you know, and that's how they do it. Um, the, I was told that the two guys from that wrote you know, "Friends in Low Places," each mm-hmm. guy made eleven million dollars. Every time a song gets played on the radio, you're getting a cha-ching. You know, the every writers. T- and uh, mm-hmm. there's a mechanical for every, you know, like on, a, on an album, like if we if for every thousand copies, you get like nine cents. 
you know, for the, hmm. the writer, so if it's two guys, you get four, four, four and a half cents yeah. each. And then the publishers get like nine but, cents. But if you do like a million copies, it's 45 grand. Wow. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. it's like that, or if it's half that. So the thing is, you can make money in mechanicals, you can take money of that. Also, too, like in TV royalties and licensing, mm-hmm. there's probably about 2,000, 2,500 cuts a year in Nashville. You know, it's, and they're pretty hard to get to. There's a circles that are pretty tight and mm-hmm. you know, it takes a while to get mm-hmm. in. But um, there's 8 million licensing TV, movies, and stuff. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. So yeah. the thing is, you know, you, and there's ways to do it that way. And you can make good money on that. You know what I mean? So, like, you know, that, that um, so you do both, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And put it out there, you know. What do you know about the, the since the state of selling CDs? doesn't exist anymore it does in certain ways like well, like, in, in, like in house concerts concerts great yeah. those mm-hmm. are you know what i mean but most people like you know down like i think what happened and i and this sort of makes me sort of mad because we used to be like an album thing you know mm-hmm. like people buying albums you know, yeah because it was like and what happened is a lot of these uh record company execs like made these bands sound every song like the sound the same because mm-hmm. so this way we know it's you formulated yeah so what happened is the albums got boring Right. And got it to a singles market like it used to be in the 50s. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So now it's single market again. So, but the the reality is, is like, you don't really need a record deal. I right. mean, I know, like, I was talking to my friend Chad. He goes, Yeah, I goes, I know guys that went platinum and didn't make, and they still didn't make any money. Wow. You know what I mean? Wow. Yeah. Because it's like they, they put, the record company put so much into it. You know what yep. I mean? And uh, by the time that you, they recoup their stuff, like, how much you get left? Nothing. You know? That's after a million records. You know? That's unbelievable. I heard a story that Ed Sheeran, before he had his record deal, he was putting his own stuff up on, uh, yeah, uh, what's the C- CD Baby? Right. He hmm. was just you know doing house concerts and and jumping from couch to couch and couch. And, and when he finally got his record deal, he got a manager situation, and they looked into his stuff, and they checked his CD Baby account, and he he had fifty grand. And a oh CD wow! Baby account That's right. great. From all the people that bought his songs digitally, right? Interesting. You know, over yeah. the course of like three or four years, right? I mean, the thing is, you can really do it. And like, if you know, like if you have an interesting video, you've seen these videos. These, you know, these, the kid that one girl that sings that Elvis Presley song is beautiful and it's like real slow and, you know, lots of reverb and everything. Just, you mm-hmm. know, five million hits. I mean, we wrote a, I wrote a song called Last Pontiac, with uh, my friend Jerry Holhouse and we, my friend uh, Gio, uh, put a video together with that, and. Uh, I haven't done anything, in it, but it has like, like close to sixty, sixty-five thousand hits already. Wow! You know, and it's yeah. like out of nowhere, and so it's it's called Last Pontiac. It's about the demise of Pontiac. I love and, that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. so yeah, so it's cool. And we'll check that one out. We've that that one's that's been around national. Everyone sort of loved it, but no one cut it. it was like, mm. oh, okay, you know? yeah. yeah. But it's been around. That's why you did the video. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, real quick, will you talk about the house concerts that you've house been doing? House concerts are great. You know, uh, I from Texas to Mississippi. Uh, I have one in Treasure Island in a couple of weeks. Um, house concerts is a new thing. Concerts are so expensive today. Mm-hmm. They're, just, they're pricey. You know, 170 bucks gets you a nosebleed seat. Yeah. yeah. Um, somebody said they went to see uh, somebody. It was like $900 a ticket, the Eagles. You know, so, per yeah. ticket. so like, you know, two tickets, $1,800. Part, mm. All of a sudden you got, you know, who has that kind of money? Yeah. So um, so what's happening is like, you know, people that like write, their, write songs, songwriters, performers, um, we do like a private show in the house. So like what they do is like usually by 20 to 30, 40 friends, everyone puts like 15, 20 bucks in. So it's a cheap night and everyone brings food and you do like little meet and greet. You play a couple, you know, play about an hour, take a little break, you know, then take another hour and people love it Yeah, because it's close, it's intimate. And they really, and I love it because when you, when you do those shows, they're really listening. Yeah, absolutely. They listen to your stories. Yeah. They listen to your songs. They really want to hear what you say, and like, and they become friends. I mean, some of them become like really good friends. Mm-hmm. Like you know, yeah. and they, you'd be surprised like how they go out of their way for you and stuff. And so it's, it's even more like, not just a fan. Like you've made friends now. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And, and your job's not to sell liquor and make yeah, people dance. Right. Exactly. No. Yes. Yeah. It's it's just so. And the and the thing is, at those situations, they buy CDs. Yeah. yeah. They sell a lot of CDs, and they like that. Interesting. You know I mean? And the thing, and also, see, I have a thing too, like. Um, for me, a little older, I think that there's a the culture of people like in that 45 to 65. If you're 65, who'd you grow up with? Beatles, Stones, mm-hmm. The Who, you know. And so their culture is like to have something in hand. Not that yeah. they can't download it, but it's mostly like, hey, I want something I can touch yeah. and feel. Yeah, I feel like yeah. I'm that way, though. You know? Myself. Yeah, and so I think, and I and as a lot of kids are going back to like things like the Beatles and stuff. Mm-hmm. We had uh, the gig I had last night. We had a table of 21, 22 year old girls. Right. Stayed all night, danced that video I showed yeah, you. They're yeah. dancing. They requested 
um, uh, summer of 69. Yep. Oh, and funny. they requested uh, Zeppelin. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. 21, 22 years because old. Because going back, and I think what's happened is like because it gets, uh, there's been a lot of sterile. But the thing is, too, I'm trying to write songs for, for everybody, but there's a crowd that, like, I mean, who has the most disposable income? 65, 62. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So why isn't we writing songs for them? And the record companies are com totally like, oh, they'll never buy. Uh, Neil Diamond mm -hmm. put out a record. I'm sure no 18 year olds bought it, but he mm -hmm. sold 2 million albums, like, yep. right away. I thought yeah. the same thing. So Absolutely. the thing is like, and so there's there's a market there, but we just have to yep. like you know have to grab it. And if you write songs, I mean, you know they're probably if you're complaining about mommy and daddy, well the mommy and daddies don't want to hear about you complaining about mommy and daddy, right. you know. Yeah. So you have to write themes that they can relate to. You yeah. know what I mean? And a lot of them are universal, like like Stardust. I thought are the only thing you know these are like sort of relatable things to both um, uh, age groups. But uh, but I think also to people that love music. And the thing is, I think that's where country music got a little more rock. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and took the place because you know classic rock is like look, don't fear the reaper great song but 40 years 40 years of don't fear the reaper yeah. like okay like <laughs> you know it's like uh, here we go again and you listen to classic rock it's like really here's brown eyed girl one more time all great songs great performances i know but you know it's like it's they want something new mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i think that's where like that's why countries did that little crossover and it's got more americana in fact I was told that Americana sold more records in country last year. That's awesome. Interesting. That's, that's yeah. cool. Wow. I believe that actually. Yep. But look, I mean, you, you know, look, some of these guys are out, like, and you know, and uh, you, you know, they're they're getting a little more rock in. They're getting a little more Americana. A little more know, acoustic, some a little sometimes more, some, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A and le I less think electronic. the like Chris alternative Stapleton. has gone that way too a little Love bit. Love Chris Stapleton. Yeah. yeah, yeah so and good. now, if you listen to Chris Stapleton, he's just, you know, there's like the, he's written a lot of big songs. You know, he's a mm -hmm. great writer. And you know, great performer like in the Steel Drivers, but he, uh, um, to me, that's really not a lot. It's more Americana than country to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's I like agree. rocking a little bit. You know, he just like, he's got that great like yep. that growly voice. I love that. You know, mm -hmm. I, I sing with a guy right with a song named Jay Edwards. He's he's like the same kind of thing. He's got this giant voice. It's like you hear him. It's like whoa, cool. It's mm -hmm. killer. You know, and nicest guy ever. You know. For more information on Tim McGeary, visit timmcgeary.com. Yeah. Well, Tim, I have to wrap it up. Okay, thank it's you so much. It's been a pleasure having you here, and I'm, I think we're going to have you on another show. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> there's just so much to you and your, your vibrance well, I want more and stories. And, <laughs> but well, thank you so much, man. I've had a, a pleasure, and, you know, it's great playing with great musicians and great people, too. It just, you know, makes it easy. You thanks, know? man. Thank that. you. Okay, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Our pleasure. Okay. Thanks, buddy. Thank you, Tim. Bye. Sarah has never seen. Tim's coming up with a groove, and she's going to read these lyrics and make a song out of it. Here you go. Walking out the door, her life is such a bore. I can't eat cheese anymore. Thank you, thank you. I've got mouth sores. I've got mouth sores. I've got mouth sores.
lyric, read the lyrics then. <laughs> Walking out the door, her life is such a bore. This is not about me. I can't eat cheese anymore. Thank you, thank you. I now have mouth sores. <laughs> Scratching out my scalp hair, dirty dishes everywhere. I opened the pantry when I wanted the fridge. I can't put down the toilet. <laughs> Meow, meow. Meow.